Hello, I'm Dr. Cheryl, and welcome to Wake Up with Dr. Cheryl. We are raising the consciousness in the relationship with wealth and unconditional love. Always remember that your present situation is not your final destination. The best is yet to come by Zig Ziglar. I'd like to start with a little joke. Three men were discussing at a bar about coincidences. The first man said, my wife was reading a tale of two cities and she gave birth to twins. That's funny, the second man remarked. My wife was reading the three musketeers and she gave birth to triplets. The third man shouted, good God, I have to rush home. When asked what the problem was, he ex exclaimed, when I left the house, my wife was reading Ali Bobby, Baba and the 40 Thieves. Our guest this evening is Molly Arthur and the wealth of eco-birthing. That's why I did the joke. Molly Arthur is a native of San Franciscan, or a native San Franciscan. She graduated from UC Berkeley and has had extensive experience working with startups and growing networks in her professional sales career. Molly and her husband of 39 years have raised two children in Marin County. Happily, her new twin granddaughters live close by in San Francisco. She is the inspiration behind EcoBirth whose vision is relating earth and birth, caring for one natural life so we will all be well. She has a fierce desire to protect all of our children and grandchildren and fully appreciate the freely given gifts of our mother earth. She sees birth as a metaphor for transformation and creation that if honored, will create a paradigm shift in our culture's consciousness. Her focus is on inspiring women to change our culture's story to compassion for the environments of earth and birth and to impel social change to sustain healthy, caring humans and a healed earth home. Molly says, I am a mother and a grandmother and I want to leave my legacy as a beloved ancestor. But right now, she says, she is responsible for the bad shape the world is in. Molly wants to try to change that as much as possible and as quickly as possible. She has a fierce desire to protect her children and grandchildren and make a better world. So EcoBirth inspires her to tell the stories of love and compassion and work with women to tell those stories so we understand our unbroken lineage, lineage to all life on earth and connection to future generations welcome molly <laughs> thank you welcome 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 thank you. we've been trying to do this for a long time yeah like months and months and you and i go back as long as we began doing this show right. or actually before because how many years is that two three years? three three years, years. Oh we're God. starting the fourth year and we took our class together our that's what i mean together. we took our our very first class yeah. our production class together and so you get to come on the show and i'm very excited to have you here Thank it's you been a long you. time coming it seems like when you were ready i wasn't when i was you weren't so anyway here we are and welcome and i would love for you to tell i uh, you're you've got some some secrets in your pockets because uh, I didn't know about your lineage uh, here and that is very honorable so please tell us your lineage here in the Bay Area thank you. San Francisco thank you well it's, it's an important part of my story I am a sixth generation Californian and a fifth generation San Francisco and it means that actually I'm a, a descendant of the conquistadors who came to the New World and up to California so my uh, middle name is Vallejo, oh, wow. Molly Faye Vallejo McGettigan. I'm descended from Mariano Vallejo, the, the city here. Vallejo, the Captain Vallejo? Well, Vallejo? General Vallejo. General Vallejo up right. that had... The city is named after him. And, and, then and the, the mistress in and... uh, no, 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 Benicia? No. <laughs> no, 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 mistress. That was his wife. No. Benicia? Benicia, Francisca Benicia Vallejo. Well, thank you, because I was, I was told oh. that was his... Oh, oh! Although that they is... did have sixteen children, 
and that, uh, and ten lived. Oh. But uh, oh, you know, wow. Francisca Benicia Carrillo was her maiden name. And she was born uh, in, uh, well, her mother was born in San Diego in 1776. Wow. So that's how we got back to the six generations. Oh. And, um, and that's your family. Right. Yeah. <gasps> My grandmother's grandfather. Was okay. Vallejo. But, the, but what I discovered in uh, my work on ecobirth uh, was that um, it was important where I came from and what of course. environment in which my uh, ancestors lived. Because I uh, had investigated and got interested in <clears throat> environmental health here in Marin County, actually, with Commonweal over in Bolinas. And um, the, the first time I got interested was at the Fairfax EcoFest. Oh. Yes. And, and how about, long ago was I, that? That was about um, eight, seven, eight years ago. Oh, okay. And I picked up a brochure that said, is your perfume poisoning you? Yeah. And I went, what do you mean, my yeah. perfume poisoning yeah. you? This is... Uh, Did you wear perfume? Uh, not very often. <laughs> but I, uh, it got me started in investigating, well, what is the influence that, that an environment may have on me? Because uh, there's pollutants in the air uh, that um, inadvertently have entered my body and polluted it and changed it and uh, harmed it such that it can be passed on to my children and my grandchildren through my body, through my breast milk. And this was a, a, an astonishing realization. And um, I was talking with uh, people about this. They said, well, you, you know, you have to realize that uh, you have to look further back than just your own lifetime, but uh, realize that you were uh, over 100 years ago, 1912, I was in my mother's body being formed as an egg in her body mm. as she was growing in my grandmother's body. So I was in my grandmother's body as a potential human being over a hundred years ago. And we, you know, the general population doesn't look at it like that. I know. But, you know, I can see your deep passion mm -hmm. because of your history. Right. See, that's part of the reason why I do my show, too, mm -hmm. is it's lineage that I've come from. But I, I totally get So I thought, well, well, then what was happening in 1912? Yeah. Because right. that would have an influence right. on um, the uh, environments. And then I thought, well, what ha it was happening to my grandmother? So she was born in 1887 mm -hmm. in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what was happening in San Francisco? Well, oh there was still gosh. the effect of the gold rush. Yes. With I mean, the mercury being brought down uh, by um, the uh, gold mining and in all, the Bay. All of the, the distilleries all of going on, the, yeah. on the ports. Of <laughs> right. Well, and all the... Um, you know, so I, I started looking into uh, you know history here in San Francisco, and I realized that there was mercury likely in the water that uh, my grandmother was drinking, and then the houses. I know exactly where she was uh, born, at eighteen hundred Golden Gate Avenue at Golden oh, wow. Gate and Masonic. Now the building's oh, gone, but I have a picture of her sitting on the front of oh, that wow. big Victorian house, mm -hmm. and. Um, it uh, interested me to uh, look into well, what would have been in the homes at that time. If she had a home birth, which is very likely that she was born, um, and I realized that there's lead in the paint. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Back older then. the paint, the more lead there is mm -hmm. in, the, in the paint itself. So in the, all the old Victorians in San Francisco, they're chock full of yeah. lead. Yeah. And um, th the history of that uh, 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 is discoverable. It's not even a, a secret. And right, in fact, we right. uh, our children are tested for lead. So at age two. just so we can stay with the lead thing just yeah, for a moment. Sure. What does lead actually do? Well, lead uh, is a hormone. Well, lead is a, a, a metal uh, a toxin. And the good news is that I'm not a scientist, so you have to take my word as, as a lay person that um, uh, it's a, a cumulative um, metal toxin that arises in the body and accumulates in the body and doesn't clear out as easily uh, as uh, other aspects of what we ingest. And um, it can um, 
uh, be a correlation with ADHD yeah. and with uh, asthma mm -hmm. and with autism. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's important for us to understand what's in our bodies. So can we purify ourselves from the lead? Yeah, so there is uh, a means of, of doing so, okay. of, of, yeah. of, of chelating, so I don't yeah. know exactly how, how that uh, yeah. functions. But um, the, the main aspect being, why did that lead happen, and why for so long? Uh, because in my looking through at the history of the lead in the United States, um, you know, Dutch boy paints, I don't know if you remember, but oh, yeah, I remember yeah. the old Dutch boy paint mm -hmm. uh, sign down there on 101. And um, the, it turns out the manufacturing plant was in Oakland. And um, there are maps that are called tox maps that the government has made available. You and I could go on the EPA website, look up the tox map, and uh, look to see what cleanup has been done oh, wow. in each location. So you can go pull up your address and on the map and find out whether there were any toxic um, cleanups that were uh, wow. made done by the EPA that, were, that people had to clean up because of that. And um, it, it's an eye-opener. It's a that it's almost a, scary. Well, it is scary. <laughs> I, I want to tell you. It is scary. And so then I got into looking at the Superfund sites as well. And of course, in San Francisco, there's the, the Bayview. Super fun? Super fun. Oh, fun. It's not a lot of fun. No, yeah, I was but. Gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to clarify that. Yes. So I think in the uh, 70s and 80s, um, during Nixon's administration, there was the uh, Clean Water Act and um, the Clean Air Act and the Superfund, uh, where the government will uh, underwrite the cleanup. Of areas, mm -hmm. and so it turns out that most of those cleanup areas are the military bases yeah. Yeah. that they had here. So, so Bayview was a, a shipyard mm -hmm. uh, from the 1880s. How interesting! And they, uh, in, in 1915 or so, the government bought the private uh, uh, location and built warships for the First World War mm -hmm. and for the Second World War. And um, I discovered in just looking through the, the information that all the asbestos and the lead and the radiation mm. and the toxins that they were using to produce the, the ships, and in fact they did radiation uh, investigation and creation there, uh, they threw over the side directly into the bay <gasps> oh with noth God. no filtering, no cleanup, and no they nothing were just until about it. 1970. Oh my goodness. 1970. Wow. It's wow. really astonishing. And right in the report, it says, and there was a Pepsi cola plant uh, right in that area whose groundwater may have been affected. Uh, oh, uh, the water that was being used to create the Pepsi cola uh, for years and years. And so, you know, what influence might that have on my grandmother mm. and on my mother? Mm. And I, I, you know, uh, back to the perfume. I thought of the perfume that my mother loved, absolutely loved, Chanel Number no. 5. <laughs> Chanel Number no. 5, it's the most popular perfume in the world, mm. still. And uh, I went to the Environmental Working Group website and they looked up Chanel Number no. 5 and there's ratings from 1 to 10 and 10 is the worst and Chanel is number 9. So Chanel actually, in its history, started in 1925. And so my mother, born in 1912, was wearing Chanel Number no. Five all her life, mm. from her youth mm. through to uh, when she was 82 and died. And um, the the uh, uh, influence so that made so, in her lifetime yeah. was she able to become aware of any of this? No, okay. no. But so a lot yeah. of this was my re-examination of our life and yeah. looking at. Uh, it occurred to me uh, that um, my mother, uh, two years after I was born, my mother had breast cancer. Wow. Yeah, so this was in 51. Do you have any siblings? Yes. My daughter, my, excuse me, my sister, oh, Patty. Oh, okay. And she's a major part of the story as well. Yeah, is she younger? She's older. She's older, And okay. she died when she was 52. Oh, wow. And she died of um, uh, cancer, multiple myeloma. Mm. cancer, which is bone marrow cancer, mm. Mm. and uh, very painful and very uh, systemic 
wide. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was very motivated to follow through on this environmental health thing because sure. I was really angry at my sister. You know, what was her problem? Why was she so incapable of living her life to its full potential? Mm -hmm. Because we, we were of a large Irish clan. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was one of eight, my grandfather one of nine, right in San Francisco. And my father's family also one of nine in San Francisco. And um, my sister uh, uh, was, we had, there were 22 in my generation, 22 cousins. Wow, yeah. yeah. And we were all very close, 16 girls. <laughs> and we all grew up together. We, with, we were within four blocks of <laughs> each other in San Francisco. Mm. And my sister was the most beautiful, mm. the most intelligent, the funniest, and, and you know, the life of the party. And, and really the most sociable, and we, we loved her. And yet, she couldn't live her life. She uh, yeah. never got married. She became obese. She mm -hmm. weighed 250 pounds and um, couldn't hold down a regular job. And uh, I looked back, okay, might there be any influences in examining this lineage in the environment yeah. here in San Francisco? Right. Well, my sister was born in 1945. Okay, think about San Francisco, one of the largest manufacturing of war materials yeah. for World War II, obviously with the Bayview and, and Richmond and over here in Sausalito yeah. in the Marin ship. Oh, yeah. 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 So my sister was born with a birth defect, and it was um, hip dysplasia, mm. which is an unformed hip yeah, socket. Yeah, that must be painful. Yeah, and, and she had... Um, she w was put in a cast at uh, 18 months, mm. and um, for a year, for 18 months, and uh, it, it formed the, the hip bone socket, and it really wasn't a permanent disability for her at all. Mm. But it seemed to be connected for me in her illness when she, uh, that she died of, which was bone marrow yeah. cancer. Was she born with a bone weakness? Mm -hmm. Was there something that was inherited from my mother yeah, wow. that, uh, you know, with, with the mercury and the lead in San Francisco and then the uh, uh, time during World War II, you know, and there's so much influence on uh, our past lineage. Yeah. And you know what, you know, what I realized is that there's cellular history. There's cellular history in our bodies that we may not be entirely cognizant of. Well, I don't think most of us are. No. I mean, I, I know. I, I mean, I am to a degree, but mm -hmm. not nearly as much as yeah. I probably should need to be. So there's a whole n new wow. science uh, called wow. epigenetics, mm -hmm. which is um, talking about the DNA expression, that uh, the DNA is not changed, but the expression of the DNA is changed. And it's really only about so, seven or eight years old. So what does that really mean? So it, it means that the environment that we live through in our own lifetime can change how our bodies function. Mm -hmm. That would be an epigenetic change, you know, the expression of, of, of that, and it can be inherited by our children and our grandchildren, which is quite extraordinary. So it's really important to know where we come from, w what environment there has been, because we are made of that, those environments right. and that maternal lineage. Hmm. That uh, has come through our mothers, and uh, an aspect that. But the, how does it? How does that affect from coming from the father? Well, uh, the, there is quality of sperm that is affected. We've seen it uh, from the um, Agent Orange. Yeah. This is where the, it became clearer that the uh, sperm uh, that can be affected by the father can uh, be shown in the children and grandchildren. So the, the, the father is as important, probably not quite as much, because our microchondria, microchondria uh, inheritance mm -hmm. is from the maternal line. Mm -hmm. And so when we do DNA uh, you know, uh, uh, exploration, they're looking actually at the maternal uh, mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's kind of got me to you know, looking at, well, you know, with the, the, uh, my maternal lineage, um, uh, uh, birth became a really important aspect <laughs> for uh, you know m my maternal expression. 
of, uh, you know, if I'm passing on something harmful to my children, you know, through the embodied birthing of them, I want to know what that is. And it, it turns out that, you know, birthing, uh, the, the specific act and how it's done can have a tremendous influence on the psychological and physical and biological health of, of our children and all future generations. And it, it, it all is a part of the lineage and the environments that, that of which we are made. And my question is, becoming aware of our own lineage, it's like, okay, then what do we do with it? Right. Especially as adults, you know, I mean, after giving birth and, you know, having an old, you know, I'm thinking for myself, yeah. my daughter's 25, right. you know, what do I do with it? How do I help her or help myself? But, you know, what, what do I do with it? Yeah, it's really important because the good news is that, of course, we're changeable. We, yes, you, you've yes. probably done a you know, fair amount of discussion about the, the brain and how plastic it is and how well Absolutely. it can change. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think that I've heard that 50% of what we are is, is, you know, our lineage, but the other 50% is how we deal with it yeah. and, and the trauma or the lack of it and the stress and the lack of it and the choice, the lifestyle choices that we make. So, you know, I only eat organic food right now, understanding that, um, that what I can control, I should control. So right, that's kind of, right. you know, the main lesson that I have, have taken from this is, you know, face the truth. And in facing the truth, <laughs> Explore. Set you free. <laughs> well, explore why it happened, mm -hmm. and that seems you know that's been a part of my journey in in figuring out well, what are what is it, you know was it that my grandmother was just ignorant and did things wrong and you know drank the wrong water or had the wrong birthing practices and of course their awareness back then was I mean anybody that had that awareness was yeah. way ahead of their times yeah but they just didn't focus on the environment exactly but it but it's so important for us to be truth-telling about this and to face the discomfort I mean it's, it's a difficult uh, thing to face that that I may be I may be a perpetrator of harm to my children and my grandchildren through my body, through my ignorance and unconsciousness. And so it's incumbent upon me to be accountable. Oh my gosh, that's about everything. <laughs> yeah. You know, be accountable about yeah. what happened and what, what, I've, what, what knowledge there is about this and be able to make it clear. And that's why I'm you know, so uh, committed to EcoBirth is to uh, you know, say, let's get out there and speak up and understand what are the influences that are affecting the quality of the human being as it is now. And before you get pregnant, oh, before you get pregnant, to be educated about this. Yes, really important. I mean, oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's such an important lesson. And to take a look around yourself personally, you know, in your home. You, you know, look at the water that you have and the paint in your house and, um, you know, how, what, how close are you to Highway 880 on, in Oakland? Because the diesel fumes from the trucks that mm. come from the yeah. Oakland port yeah. have a tremendous oh, effect sure. on uh, what we would call the frontline communities, the people who live there and have yeah. to live in the poor housing. Yeah. So it, it, the, the realization of the actual inequity of the effects of this has been a major opening and, and realization for me in my work in the world. Of is course. that you know I, I have the privilege of choosing to live where I I can, and now I understand why more people live in Marin County because I, they're not next to a manufacturing plant or next to the old Dutch boy paints. Well, <laughs> you know I'm I'm questioning now uh -huh. because I li I just moved back to Sausalito. And I know they build ships there. Correct. And so now I'm questioning the Marin ship. The Marin Kaiser. ship, yes. So I've looked into that a little bit. Oh, okay. Over at Sausalito. Okay. And um, and I'm I'm curious. I don't know much about it. It wasn't a super fun site. So I would like to know exactly what cleanup they did. Yeah. Because what we know right now is at Treasure Island, where they have done cleanup. Oh. There's things coming up. 
from uh, the, the ground where they've already done yeah. development around. Yeah. We know over at... Um, How about in Alameda? Yeah. I mean, Alameda, I guess, was a real dump. Oh, my you know, gosh. I mean, well, exactly. Oh, the Navy. Right, exactly, oh. the Navy. And then Bayview, they just yeah. cleaned it up for 30 years as a super fun site, and they turned it over to San Francisco uh, two years ago. Yeah. And they have a major plan for development. Yeah, well, and, you know, so it's likely that, you know, they're still off, off putting uh, gases because generally yeah. what they do in the cleanup is they take away some of the earth. Uh, but they cap it and, uh, you know, have it. Oh. So, you know, how is it being It's still done? there. Yeah. It's not necessarily all gone. So, you know. I wonder uh, what the solution is there. Yeah. You know, I mean, it must cost a lot of money yeah. to clean that well, up. Well, luckily the government's been taking some responsibility in doing well, that. But, you know. And they're slow in others. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's the wake-up call to say no longer pollute. Yeah, like wow. this, no longer create oh, what is the, lar the the pollution that's I in our environment. That's the wake up call. Well, yeah. And um, you know what uh, I realized in looking at my lineage as well is that um, my uh, uh, great great grandfather on my grandmother's side uh, was uh, the father of mining in Utah mm. in 1860. He was sent over there to supposedly contain the Mormons so they wouldn't go to the south. <laughs> but he became a you know in a conflict with um, Brigham Young, uh, not farming but starting mining, mm -hmm. and the Bingham uh, mine there in Salt Lake City is the largest open pit mine on Earth. Wow! On Earth. So if you were up in Mars, you would see the the Great China Wall and this open pit mine. Wow. Next to Salt Lake City, and the the most pollution that we get in our world, in our air, still is mining. Mining. So it's really important to understand that we have five refineries up near Benicia. Right. My, that is named after my great great grandmother. Oh goodness. That Vallejo started, yeah. and and um, it's important to know that uh, they know exactly what is uh, being uh, put off put as pollution because they measure it. And you can go to the EPA sites and you can see exactly the measurement of what uh, is still coming out. And they So why don't they take more responsibility? <laughs> right, so they, they say there's an acceptable level. Well, what's acceptable? It, exactly. To whose standard? Right. <laughs> yeah, not to my standards as a mother who, in, who ingests it in my body and passes it on to my children. No, no, so I want the mining to be changed. I want the air pollution to be stopped. And uh, I want Chevron refinery, who they claim doesn't get blown over to Marin County, gets blown to the East Bay. But we are very close to Richmond. We are very close to Chevron. What about when Chevron off foot and had the fire? And the, 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 the tar sands uh, trains that are coming from Canada, and we know have blown up different towns, uh, within a two-mile radius of those trains, which are volatile, more volatile than the regular oil that comes in on the ships, um, you know, we're in. People are in a two-mile radius. My daughter's in a two-mile radius from uh, a train in Sacramento that could blow up her house if it came. So it, that's the truth telling: is to figure out why. And you know what? Why people, is this happening to me? And people are going to be in fear about this right and they you know I, I mean it's like fear about the chemtrails same thing yeah. people are are in fall in denial correct because it's, they don't want to take responsibility it's hard to grasp it's hard to grasp and it's hard to deal with even you know personally um my mom, i have you know twin granddaughters and they live very close by and i've been able to be uh, with them a lot and uh what a privilege uh, but and my daughter-in-law was nursing them, and at one point I think it was three or six months in, she said, "Well, uh, Mimi, what do you think about these pillows, the the nursing pillows that I'm using? Do you think that they have flame retardants in them?" I said, "Well, I know they do, because all of the foam 
in California yeah. had to have flame retardants put in them for, with some bizarre yeah. law passed 20 years ago. Yeah. And um, she stopped nursing the next day. And it's, I mean, that is so tragic for me to, you know, understand. Well, it's tragic that she can't nurse her children and feel comfortable. Exactly. You know, and, and it's best for the children, you know, to right. be able to have that. To have that bond and yeah. have the attachment. Yeah. And there's still, uh, you know, uh, advantages. I mean, that's what we are constantly told. There's still tremendous advantages over breast milk, which, you know, in my uh, investigation shows, you know, the oh, longer totally. you breastfeed, oh, the healthier yeah. your child is. Yeah, within reason. Yeah, well, <laughs> what's the reason, you know? What, you, they, I mean, you could breastfeed. They, they're, they're now saying two years, even the AMA, uh, or ACOG. Well, is my daughter two years. breastfed for 14 months. Nice. My daughter for 20, 22 months. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good for them. And I breastfed my mother. Well, you know, I, yes. Excuse me. You, I, I didn't. Your mother. Oh, you didn't. No, I uh, yeah. didn't get uh, breastfed. I didn't by my either. Mother. Everyone, in, no one in my generation was breastfed. I didn't know. I, my, I wasn't either. Yeah, in the 40s and the 50s, forget it. Yeah. You know, they took those babies away. Yeah. Well, first of all, my mother was knocked out. She said she was very happy that she was knocked out. And, um, and the story is that uh, she left me in the nursery, her third child, and went home for a party. Oh! <laughs> Holy so what it, you know what is that psychologically? Well, you know when you say that I was an RH baby, mm -hmm. so they took me away. Mm. My mother didn't know what was going on. Right. Oh gosh. She didn't. She didn't understand. Yeah. And so you had your entire blood changed. Total. I had a transfusion. Yeah. Yeah. So you know I know that's affected me. Yeah. I I, I mean it's made me much more independent and mm -hmm. almost detached right. on some level. Yeah. Now, so yeah. there are really extraordinarily interesting implications of how one is birthed and what happens during the birth and right after the birth. And there's a lot to know. And, and in, during gestation, really important. So we were talking about the toxins and what can happen with the perfume mm. is that the mm. phthalates in the perfume, mm -hmm. which is under the name parfum, or fragrance. Mm. So what you don't know is exactly mm. what's in there All because they say it's a trade stuff. secret, the hidden stuff. But what's in there is uh, a phthalate that is a hormone disruptor. Mm. So that what can happen during sure. gestation is that, uh, let's say my sister's birth defect that um, affected her bones. Uh, at any time between week seven and week 12, if there was a hormone disruption in her growth, of week seven and week 12 during my mother's pregnancy, she, it could have affected how the bones were growing in her body. Hmm. That's how precise you could be, obviously, about the development right. and the influence. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's so important for us to understand. I'm wondering why the medical world doesn't focus more on this. They, you know, they look at it, but it, uh, what, they have 15 minutes to work with us when we go in and have oh, a doctor's Oh, it's disgusting. I know. You know, and, and, I, I mean, I, oh, that's... Yeah, it's, no, the, so the, the, the history, there's a very interesting, extraordinary history of medicalization of birth in the United States. And just in my own lineage, in my uh, exploration, I have my mother's baby book, and I know where she was born. So she was born at Va on Van Ness and Broadway. <laughs> and the building is still there, and it's condos now. But it was one of the first maternal hospitals. So in 1912, my grandmother went with her first child, my mother, to this maternal hospital. So why do you go to a maternal hospital? So you can have drugs. Oh. Because the doctors yeah. were the only ones who could prescribe right. drugs, not the midwives. Right. And you couldn't have drugs But at they home. called it a maternal hospital? Yeah, because it was just, that was the emphasis. It was oh, just okay. a maternity okay. oh, okay. birthing babies. Okay. Yeah. So then I looked up into, well, what kind of drugs? would they have been taking, and um, scopolamine was starting to be used. So that's the date rape drug that's still oh around. Oh my goodness. That enables uh, a woman to forget what happened. Oh it wow. It affects your memory. So what would happen, and there's history and pictures and videos, and, you know, it's all documented, is that women would be given uh, scopolamine and morphine, 
but they would still be in pain. Their body would still be in pain. And they would uh, tie them down to the gurney, I want to tell you. They would tie them down to the gurney, hands and feet, so that they, when they thrash around in pain, wouldn't be hitting the doctors and the nurses. And they used lamb's wool for the, for the attachments so that their husbands afterwards wouldn't see the bruises on their bodies. And so they were out. My mother was out when I was born. I don't know if she was restrained or not. Mm. But uh, so that was the way that the, the midwives were expelled from, the, from their work with women is that in America, they, th they threw the midwives, they never let them be in the hospitals. Uh, and in other countries, they, like in England, you know, call the midwife, the midwives yeah. were included and they're still in the system. So there's a tremendous difference in, in the, so the medicalization of, well, the doctors were in charge. And that's why, you know, women were laid down and, and in the 40s and 50s, they, uh, you know, were drugged and babies were dragged out with forceps because the women weren't in labor, which is, and then they didn't breastfeed. And uh, there's really a whole generation of ramifications for this that we, you know, Well, it, do, it makes sense. I mean, I look at my grandmother and my mother, mm -hmm. and my grandmother uh, developed polio oh, between wow. my mother and my uncle. Ah. And my mother was, kind of shunned to the side mm -hmm. and she was not very loving oh. you know she did the best she could right but she um, in fact my cousin used to say my second cousin used to say my mother came out pushing everybody away and she was also an alcoholic yeah so so addictions <laughs> are really oh. really important so I look at I have pictures of my uh, you know extended family my mother's family and I can tell you how many addicts. Oh, sure. 80% wow. of yeah. all generations. Wow. In my generation, I don't know about my children's generation, but um, uh, we were either food addicts like my sister yeah. or smoke ad smoking, you know, tobacco yeah. Yeah. And, and alcohol, very real. And, yeah. um, you know, so the addictive aspect of uh, the response to trauma and stress, and you know, where it's, does that come from? And does my sister's from? addictive. She's way overweight and she smokes. Yeah. So that addictive thing came out with her, and right. I think my brother's a little addictive too. Yeah, it, it's tough, you know, because there are so many influences. And, and what came to me was I had blamed my sister for her addictions. I blamed oh. her for her, and, mm. and I realized mm. it really wasn't mm. her fault. It wasn't her but fault. It, but it is our responsibility to take it and be accountable for it and heal right. ourselves so we can be healthy. Yes. That's the most important thing is right. having the awareness mm -hmm. and waking up and having that awareness. Yeah. On waking all up and being conscious yes. and then changing it. Yeah. Well, okay. that's... You know, not having to be in denial about it, which is right. tough, but, but also understanding that it's really incumbent upon us to change these systems of harm uh, which surround us, you know, and why are they happening? Why do, is there a medical industrial complex that doesn't give respect to the birthing women and, and says, okay, we must be, uh, you know, staffed and, and let's do a C-section because it's within the time frame of Monday to Friday, you know, and there's ramifications of that. So we need to wake up and speak up as life givers and birth givers to say, I don't accept the way these systems are working anymore. And that's really my work now uh, with what, what a, a group of us are calling birth keepers, where we're looking to guard and protect um, our birthright of being born healthy and loved <laughs> in a just and flourishing world, a flourishing world, not just sustainable. And then we yeah. honor, we honor women and the relationships uh, that are uh, life-giving in what we would call mother-baby, mother-earth. Because it's an immutable, this mother-baby, you know, we, from our maternal line, we come through, we are, and we are of that, uh, um, in, you know, 
uh, environment and of that relationship and what has been abrogated. We're talking about this, you and I, right now with our mothers, with our grandmothers. And, um, you know, uh, we had breastfed our children and we were close with our daughters. And now, what, what's in, what do we need to, how do we help our daughters understand the importance of what this relationship is? And it's, you know. Right now, my daughter and I are going through a tough time, yeah. but, you know, that's, that's part of the age thing. And, right. You know, so that this is also helping me prepare for when we get back together. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it is immutable. This relationship, oh, yeah. we only have one mother. That's right. And we are made of, and what's really beautiful for me is that we are made of all the cellular history of the entire lineage back when we're talking about the grandmother right. and the grandmother Great and the grandmother. grandmother and the grandmother, all the way back to, then all of a sudden I realized we literally are all related. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Every one of us. We are completely yeah. related and we are made of what? We are made of, how did life start? <laughs> you know, somehow the starburst, we have stardust, you know, they're from the 60s, but we are, we have that stardust. I, I just have a little story, which is very special. I have a girlfriend that I met in driver's training. <laughs> we were in ninth, we were going into high school, uh -huh. ninth grade going yes. into high school. And we just found out her father was doing, um, some ancestry oh. digging mm -hmm. and he found out that our families are actually oh. Oh, they are we are right. family <laughs> that you know it's wow. it's yeah and so karen and i no matter what we are like cousins Isn't you know beautiful? but we were so close it's and wonderful. such good friends and yeah. you know best friends and now we're actually related i think that yeah. it was like oh my goodness yeah. well we are sisters yeah. <laughs> and sometimes i feel possessed you know w w what am i made of i'm made of everything that, everything that came before <laughs> you know and then then i am consciously creating myself you know, this is, I, I eat the right food, I live the right, yes. right way, I don't right. eat sugar, I don't yeah. drink alcohol, uh, you know, and, and I do that on purpose so that, you know, I have an in, integrated uh, integrity between what I am in the world and how I'm living. Right. Setting an example. Right. Hopefully, you know, a model, but that's, it's not easy. No, it's not. No. Because there's, there's temptations, especially with the sugar. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have to say that recently I've been eating a little bit more, mm -hmm. and it's and, and it's like it's addictive. Well, it is addictive, I'm a sugar of addict. course. I'm absolutely sugar addict. And no of course, yeah. and then I catch myself, mm -hmm. and I say, no, stop. Yeah. You know, because I know this is not healthy for me because it's feeding into that addiction, mm -hmm. and it's it makes it harder to lose weight. You can't lose weight, mm -hmm. you know, etc. So yeah. I, I go through these. Yes, so, but figuring out who we are, who we are authentically with, um, you know, our lineage and the, the fact that we are made of so many other things. And then, uh, you know, being centered in, in who we are. I mean, I understand that I am a, a descendant of uh, family members who perpetrated uh, genocide, perpetrated massacres. Um, started mining that's poisoning millions of people. This is something to realize that I can't deny and say that it's not me. So where and what do I do with that? Well, that's the key. Is right. what, what are you doing yeah. with it? So I'm, I'm getting out into the streets, to tell you the truth. I'm going out and protesting. Tomorrow, I'm going to uh, go to Mission Dolores and as uh, a descendant of a conquistador, I'm going to protest at 1 p.m. against Junipero Serra being called a saint. Oh, wow. Junipero yeah, Serra, yeah, yeah. who perpetrated slavery, mm. massacre, mm. death, mm -hmm. personally brought that and it decimated 90% of the indigenous people. Absolutely astonishing. The horrors, the horrors. And I used to be so proud, you know, that I was a descendant of Galeo, oh, you know, oh, the missions yeah, and la yeah, la, yeah. until I learned more about it. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a, that is essential for us to, okay, well, I'm going to stand up and I won't be an indigenous person. I will be 
where I have come from, which is I will renunciate what yeah, has right. been done. Well, I, I have some lineage that came in, to, in the 1700s mm -hmm. into uh, South Carolina, that my English ancestry, yeah. who and I've talked about this on my show before, yeah. and uh, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, uh -huh. who actually started um, the first Bible society oh. in the U.S. In the U.S. But I had a writer in my car mm -hmm. that said, oh, well, he he advocated slavery. Mm -hmm. I had never heard that before. Yeah. So it's like, the, now I want to do a little bit more digging on, yes, you know, I mean, really... was this to make, maybe he stopped and he started the Bible Society. Well, to, I mean, there's there's no you know, disconnect uh, between Christianity and Bible study yeah. and slavery. I mean, well, yeah, well look at yeah. why Sarah came, yeah. because he thought the indigenous people actually were less than mm. than the yeah. European, yeah. but uh, that they should be saved, that he should ignorance, save them. Ignorance, ignorance, ignorance. And you know, <laughs> they, the 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 Franciscans who came over and the Dominicans who came over in 1492 when Vallejo's ancestors first came yeah. over brought the Inquisition yeah. with them. There were Inquisition trials in Costa Rica and Puerto Rico in the New World mm -hmm. and what they were doing to the indigenous was just the continuation mm -hmm. of their persecution yeah. of what they perpetrated in, in Europe. And what I discovered was that Vallejo, I finally went back and I thought I'm going to look into Spain and so uh, Vallejo was listed on the Inquisition list because he had come from Sephardan Jews and converted. And he was a converso. Hmm. His family were converso. And so they were thrown out of Spain. No wonder they were uh, admirals and, and sailors and came to the New World oh. with Columbus. That's because oh. they were thrown out. Yeah. Right? And so they were uh, from persecution. Mm -hmm. And I found out the Irish side came over during the potato famine. <laughs> so the systems of oppression mm -hmm. and the systems of harm that have been all in that all stress. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And well, oh, uh, you know, the death. And you know, I can feel frequently, you know, the sense of it. You know, I can feel the the witches burning that the Inquisition did to not only, you know, the male ancestors who they didn't believe converted and therefore they, you know, tortured them to admit to it, but to the women and to the midwives mm -hmm. who were mm -hmm. killed. And then that whole sensibility is brought over here and perpetrated on the... Uh, it's amazing. It is totally this amazing. This has got to change. This oppression has got to change. And we got to wake up to what's happening to the uh, people who have, are receiving the brunt of this, which of course they're marginalized. And so, uh, and then next Monday, I'm gonna go with, uh, down uh, and protest uh, Wall Street West against racism and uh, patriarchy and capitalism, because this is not working I witnessed, anymore. I witnessed some racism mm -hmm. over at Safeway mm. this afternoon. Really? Between an African-American woman and a Mexican woman. Mm -hmm. It was disgusting to mm -hmm. me. It's like, we're in 2015, yeah. wake up. No, 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 it is absolutely endemic in our society. It's a part of the fabric of oh, how the United States was, I was created. I, I had to leave. I left because I, you know, and I should have said, what are you two doing? Yeah. You know, you, you're supposed to be working together. You're supposed to be. No, but see, because we have internalized oppression. That, that is very real. I have internalized oppression from my understanding about, you know, uh, oppression against women. And think of how internalized African Americans and indigenous. Oh, I, I know. Uh, well, there's uh, been, that's uh, been going on for centuries. Well, this is what we're saying. Centuries and, and, it's and still, centuries. And it's still going on. The, the patriarchy. Because of the lack of awareness and education. Right. So I've really been exploring uh, white privilege and what that means uh, in the world now and in my work with EcoBirth and with birth keepers because um, you know, the infant mortality of an African American child in the United States is three times higher, yeah, three times higher sure. than yeah. a, a white child. Yeah. And the maternal mortality and so as well the, is, is twice as high. Maternal mortality, the women are dying now, in what is supposed to be a great medical system, you know, 
we have the 60th worst infant and, uh, and maternal mortality in the world. We have the worst infant and maternal mortality of any developing, any developed country. We, the United States. You know, ACOG, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, are responsible and they are trying on in some way, but they're a complete hierarchical, uh, patriarchal uh, system. They don't, uh, you know, they don't really respect women. They're happy to drug them. Oh my goodness, them, oh. this is just so <laughs> primitive <laughs> I, to me. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and um, it's deeply intimate. Oh my gosh. It's very personal Oh, for I, us I, I as mean, women. This is essential for well, us. Well, yes, of course. I mean, this is what we've been fighting for centuries, actually. Boy, I tell you, reproductive justice, the reproduct reproductive life is just turning backwards, backwards, back. It's astonishing what's happening for women in the United States. Absolutely hmm. amazing. And, uh, you know, we really do have to no longer consent to this. And, and I'm, you know, I'm not working with the Democrats and the Republicans, and, and I think the systems, they're, they're, they're falling apart as we look and as we see these systems are uh, Well, they're dying. not working. They're absolutely they're not working. broken. They're absolutely yeah, not working, yeah, no. you know. No, and, that, that is true. And, and we need a grassroots movement yeah, and a grassroots from all of us who understand how we're related and how we can uh, step into resistance and protest. And, you know, for me personally, it's, it's a challenge, you know, how do I speak up? When will I speak up? When and how will that look? And, you know, I grapple with where and what that is. Well, like Mother Teresa said, if you're, gonna, if you're going to advocate peace, then you go to a peace rally. You don't go to an anti-war rally. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be done with a positive way. Right. You know, all positivity. I mean, that's why I'm doing my show. Right. Is to do it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. and. And how, keep that hope and faith right. that things are better, yeah. that things can get better. No matter what it is, things can get better. Exactly. So, you know, faith in actually the human being, the human spirit, is foundational to why I stay involved and work. Because you really do have to believe in a higher good. Oh, well, that's a given. Yeah. That is numero uno, mm -hmm. actually, and giving, and giving gratitude for what the positive and the good that we have right. in our lives. And, and keep that unconditional love. Right. Absolutely that's, unconditional that's love. That's the most that's important. The, that's the baseline without diminishing the, the reality. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. I mean, you can look at the reality, mm -hmm. but, you, you know, for me, you know, I, I realize all the... Maybe not all, but I realize what I have come from, right. and I I just choose not to follow in that path. Right. You know, so awake and conscious. Yeah. And making steps and having a daily practice. Absolutely. And it takes discipline. Yes. It takes it's a big deal. It takes big discipline yes. to do that, and every day, and sometimes mm -hmm. in every moment. You know, depending on where you are mm -hmm. in your work in progress, because yeah. we're all works in progress. So, and and our time is coming oh. down. We could do, we could continue to do this. I'm sure yes. for this show because you have so you have a plethora of information, and I I'm very happy that, to know you better Thank and you, to Cheryl. see your foundation. I had no idea that it was so vast. Uh, you know, it's been a, a wonderful exploration. It's been a spiritual path for me. It's oh, a spiritual of journey. Of enlightening. Of, of, you know, it's a calling in some way and a vocation yeah, to, yeah, passion. to be clear about where uh, and how we can improve our world for the future generations. We must have a world of care and compassion. Oh, my God. We if, if we don't have unconditional love. Right. I mean, I talk about it every day. Mm -hmm. I'm driving in the city. And I have I talk to twenty to forty maybe fifty people a day, and I'm I'm talking about these. Well, and the model of unconditional love is Mother Baby, Mother Earth. Yeah, that's right. Pure that's gift. The, that's the model. Pure for relationship. Sure. Yeah. Pure love. Yeah. yeah. 
and that's what we're about. Yeah. And and yes, I know that I have to remind myself, you know, when things are kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the stress or whatever, I have to remind myself of that. Yeah. You know, we're human. We are human <laughs> and we're related to it all and we yeah. are spirit. If, well. if there's anything else that you would like to share, uh, you know, as a wrap, <laughs> because just, just our the, time is coming up yeah. to finish. And well, I'm, just that, the, you know, faith really is the journey of, of consciousness and um, understanding who we are and where we come from and that th there's a responsibility to that consciousness and there's an accountability and there's a stepping out and a forward and we as life givers have authority to speak up. We don't need to be scientists. We don't need to be mm -hmm. anything but I gave life and my future generations are who I want to become a beloved ancestor for, as we said yes. in the beginning. Yes. So I want them to look back on me and say, all right, this happened on your time frame, you know, grandmother, but what did you do about it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I just got goosebumps on that. So thank you. Thank you so much for You're sharing, welcome. definitely, and coming on. It was well beyond worth it. We've been <laughs> trying to do this Thanks. for a long time, yeah. and I so appreciate you coming on. Well, thank, thank you, you for so your, much. Your beautiful presence and, and work in enabling unconditional love to come out and the uh, abundance that is free gift, that is is an offering that's so important for the world. Yeah, and it's it's wealth, and it isn't just money. No. You know? Yeah. So thank you so You're much. You're welcome. <sighs> <sighs>